Hi. Uh, hi. Good afternoon. We're almost at noon, but uh, how are you guys doing? You good? You good? Uh, so, so I wanted to talk about uh, code splitting in a way, uh, where it might this might seem like an antithesis to code splitting, and uh, as if I'm deterring you from code splitting. Uh, I was just curious, how many of you guys here in your orgs uh, code split? Your apps. A quick, a quick raise of hands would be nice. Oh, that's a lot. I'm going to make a lot of you angry. And are there people who don't believe in code splitting? I uh, think that this is a waste of your time. Are there? Nice. I like it, right? Uh, but I'm going to make you angry as well. Uh, so what we're talking about is what happens when you chunk way too hard. Uh, so I'll set some context for who I am and why I'm giving this talk. Uh, and we'll also keep this session a little bit interactive. So if someone has any queries, uh, they want to, they have any questions, they want to stop me in between, please raise your hand. Someone will reach out to you, uh, reach out to you with a mic, and then we can, you know, take questions instead. Uh, so I work at Tata One MG, and uh, we are an e-commerce healthcare company. Uh, but our like team's primary focus has been performance for a lot of like the last few years, right? Uh, in August 2018, we got, uh, when Google sent out a new update to PageRank, uh, our page went from being at the third or fourth rank to being in the third or fourth page. Right? So that meant uh, insane loss of business. And at that point, we realized that there was a lot of room for us to grow in terms of performance, and we started doing performance uh, specifically. And today, the team is... Uh, Performance is so ingrained into our team is that we can't think of any feature that we ship without benchmarking it first, without figuring out all the approaches that we can take. Um, and this is what we are going to talk about, right? What happens when you chunk way too hard? Uh, and 1MG would be an example of this because you'll, you'll see further how, how we are chunking it. Uh, so we came here at React India in 2021. Uh, we showed what uh, you know, how to make your website faster, what is it that we are using, uh, your network uh, strategies, what your resource hint should look like, and, you know, how do you reuse components, how should your design system also leverage, should be aimed towards uh, performance. And uh, we sort of achieved a fairly quick time for an e-commerce website, uh, which is about three seconds interactivity, and then our payload, JS payload was about 250 KB. And I'm glad that the couple of people right before me talked about, uh, you know, Addy and Google generally pushing hard about how JS bytes are very different than media bytes. Uh, and that is also something that we really targeted really hard. So if you want to get into this, uh, it would, you might want to check out the 2021 talk. And then we did not stop there, right? So we, you, we went out in 2022 and uh, a colleague of mine, Parth, he was like, what if we want to optimize it even further, right? Take, take this a step ahead. I think this was enough, uh, but yeah, we did not want to stop. Uh, so what happened is that we wanted to marry SEO optimizations and ensuring that our page works best for SEO with all the performance that we wanted to pull in. Uh, and that was not possible because of the way we do things. Uh, so we figured out a way and uh, we popped in 100 live at React India stage last year. Uh, for an e-commerce website, I think that's pretty huge. Uh, so let me let me show you what it looks like today, right? So this is what my initial load is, right? This is 1MG. Uh, this was in hotel right now at the terrible Wi-Fi that we've got. But if you can see here, right, our SSR is like a very partial render of what content needs to go out, and it stops very quickly. Uh, so we stream as fast as possible and get the first paint out to the users. But in reality, you'll see that you know, things look very different to the users instead. Uh, so I think it's worth thinking about what your SSR pipeline looks like uh, and if you want to change it up. And if you look at navigation, right, what happens later? And we're talking about how hard we code split. So you'll see that we've got widgets, uh, containers, and like every small thing is inside a JS bundle instead. And we also breach the usual law where people say that, you know, your, your bundle size shouldn't be so small that you pay more, pay extra for just the connection, right? Uh, I think that's not true today. Uh, it used to be there some time ago, but H2 solves a lot of these problems on it by itself. Uh, and if you want to dive deeper into this, we also did a workshop last year, uh, Performance 101, uh, and which is apparently talked about quite a lot. And if you find Sahil anywhere, you, you should 
bug him to upload it to YouTube. Uh, so if if we'll go through this, you'll see that you know these are so many chunks that we've got, and everything is being loaded as we go down. But even when you go to the next page, you'll see. Let me clear it up. Yeah, you'll see that there are few bundles that are just loaded. Right. Uh, so as people navigate and explore one MG, more and more chunks are being saved to their cache. Uh, and we reuse this quite heavily. But why are we doing this? Uh, one could be hitting 100 being the vanity number, right? Uh, but primarily because it actually works, right? And it, and it helps and it matters because you want your people to feel that your app is faster. You want them to go through content a lot quicker. You don't want them to be stuck in a frustrated manner. Uh, and also because it works. We've proven that it works, right? Uh, and you're expecting a but, but I'll give you a however. We're a big however, and it's that uh, it amplifies a problem. And the problem is that when you've chunked this hard, your network waterfalls can become a little shady, uh, and you, you would want to optimize for that. But there are more ways of doing it. So something that really occurs is artifacts, and I'm not talking about rustic, uh, items that you've got in your house which are fancy looking and from days past. Uh, we're talking about errors and glitches on the screen that users can perceive. So what, what kind of artifacts am I talking about? Right? We went through 1MG just now. But I, I'd like to highlight some of the artifacts that you'd see here. Can you see loaders all the way? Then you see another set of loaders. Then you go, then you check out, click the responsive. Uh, it's not that responsive. Images pop up instantly, right? So one is loaders within loaders, big no. I don't think we should do it. Then we've got, uh, uh, you know, view changes are not that smooth. None of these transitions were clean. This app lacks finesse. It's fast, but it's not, uh, it does not feel finished. And uh, there is no preemptive optimization. Every time you clicked on search, at, that is when we decided that we should fetch search, right? Uh, we should do it a lot earlier. And it can introduce confusion between the user because while the, while the search bar was active, the loader still signified to the user that you know the page is still loading. Right? So we do not want to put user in a position where they are sort of confused about what state they are in. Now, we've, we've established by now that we've nailed down objective performance. What we've, but what we've also established is that perceived performance will always trump objective performance. And there are like four factors that I really like uh, from uh, Gemma Petrie and Heather McGaw's research at Firefox Quantum. Uh, this was a couple of years ago when they were trying to figure out how do we make Firefox feel a lot faster to users. And they came up with you know, four things. One is duration. Right? Duration is one of the biggest factors. It's about how long does a single task take. It can involve multiple stages, but how long does this task take? Uh, it's responsiveness. So whenever a user has any input on your app, how fast is the feedback from your app? And that is very critical, I think. Uh, the third is fluency, like we talked about. I think uh, we did not have uh, any finesse to our app, and that is because of fluency. And the fourth is that you know tolerance. And this is a factor that is external. You can't really control it. Uh, I can have a very different tolerance level than you. And you might be prone to quitting the tab a lot quicker than me, right? Uh, so we need to figure out what our user, user base is like, right? So it will be worthwhile sitting down with your analytics team and checking out what the bounce rates are like and why those bounce rates are like that, right? So there are two ways to optimize for these four factors. Uh, one is optimizing the entire app, and we've already done this. We've, we've gone through the entire part. There are three you know, large talks. The workshop is four hours. so. I mean, I don't know how you're going to sit through that, but people did, and I'm thank thankful for that. Uh, but then the other part is, uh, how do you optimize for the con area that is visible to the user? Focusing on just that part, right? Uh, and why do you want to optimize for ATF? And it's usually called above the fold. Uh, I would recommend that you do not prioritize only for the first fold. You prioritize for two, three folds at least. Uh, because the user is bound to interact with your app, and the first interaction usually is scrolling, right? So you'd want to optimize for this. Now this is a small page, right? 
uh, we've been yeah going about it for a while. This is just the home page, and uh, luckily, what I realized was that I've hit the limit that uh, uh, Apple's has set for the full screen, uh, full page screenshots. So this was not the end of the page. There's still more content right after it, right? Um, so why do we want to optimize for above the fold? Uh, not all components are equal. There will be components, and someone just before me spoke about how some components might be poorly written, and they might take up all of the resources on the user, and the thread, you've only got a single thread to work with. Developers are also humans. People can leave issues behind, and you would not want to be bogged down by those issues. Uh, your pages can be very, very long, right? Very evident by what we've seen here. Uh, the problem that we have is that how do you mitigate problems with pages like these? Uh, can, can anyone take a guess, wild guess, how long this page would be in pixels? <coughs> yeah, do we have any, any random number? Man? I, I'm sure all of us are developers, you've seen this page. 10,000, okay. Huh? 6,000. I see. Well, you're not even close. <laughs> we are at 40,000 pixels here. Yeah. So, and I can guarantee you, no user of yours is going to sit down and scroll through 40,000 pixels. I'm, I'm sorry, right? So let's not optimize for the rest of the 40. Maybe the first 2,000 pixels are great. Uh, so what should you do, right? What should you completely avoid? I'm sorry. Uh, and don't send a blank HTML. Please send some content in your SSR. Uh, lazy loading in the first fold is not great. Lazy, load, lazy loading is great, chunking is great, but not in the first fold. Uh, you'd, want to, you'd want to avoid dealing your render, your JS, your images. Images are very important. They act as anchors in your page, right, that the people can do. Uh, and they, they form like the foundations, good compression, uh, load them faster, use other strategies like blurring, etc. Move to a CDN maybe, right? Uh, not having pre-allocated space for media. Uh, I'm glad that we have metrics like INP and LCP, uh, and also uh, layout shifts, CLS, because this is what is going to affect all of these three metrics. And you would want uh, to optimize for them because these are perceived performance metrics that we just talked about. Uh, and swapping fonts later, and this is a big one, right? The first thing that renders is the font, and you do not want to delay font. People use... Uh, uh, you know, font display block, fallback, swap, I don't think they are great. And if you are using swap, please at least CSS size adjust, right? So that your fonts are, uh, at least you don't have layout shifts. Uh, let's do a quick recap, right? Uh, so we saw loaders within loaders, all of these things. Now, we also saw the four factors. Can you guess where loaders within loaders sit? You, we had duration, responsiveness, Fluency and tolerance. <coughs> tolerance. Tolerance is an external factor. It's the user's tolerance, not ours. Yeah. So where does loader, loader within loader sit? It's, it's fluency or duration. Depends on where you're using the loader, right? Uh, what about view changes are not smooth? Any, any clue? Come on, man. I think it needs to be a two-way communication here. Fluency. Oh, damn, you guys are good. Uh, this is responsiveness. What about the fourth one? Any, any wild guess? No, none. Tolerance? No, man. This is just a statement. This doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about human psychology, right? Because this is important. Uh, we, need to talk, we need to think of people as people. Uh, and there are two phases of the brain. There is an active side and there is a passive side of the brain. Uh, the active side is, uh, you know, you, you can sort of denote that phase, categorize that phase as when the user is engaged into something, and the passive phase is when, you know, there is no real engagement towards it. So giving people things that are moving, things that they can read, those are important. And you want to keep people in the active phase. The other reason why you don't want to uh, won't want them to shift to the passive phase is that uh, if there's time dilation when they move to a passive phase, and we're not talking about Albert Einstein's theory around you know the bigger the mass, the slower the time. Uh, but we are talking about how being in the passive phase uh, actually yields a 36% increase in how you experience time. So 
So this is a direct multiplier of 1.36, right? And if there is a tolerance threshold for some user and you're taking up some amounts by all the mistakes that we've, we've done, putting them in a passive phase is a direct multiplier to their tolerance and they'll quit the app a lot quicker, right? You, you, you do not want to go there. And when we talk about engagement, one of the biggest engagement I feel like is our games. Like, I really love them. This is a footage from Crisis 2. Uh, this is an old game. If you check out what's happening, right? Uh, you go to the door, there's a checkpoint that was saved. Right? Now there's this like long masking area, right? Can you guys sort of tell me what's going on here? Why was this sequence specifically added? Yeah, right? And you know that this is not just something that you have, uh, this is not a problem only in games, this is a problem in websites as well. Especially when you've chunked too hard. You, you need to load things prior to people uh, reaching out for them because uh, you don't have those assets available. You're not loading them beforehand. Um, so what they figured out, what they did was, they finalized the intent. So when the user was going towards the door and clicking to open the door, you know that this is where they want to go. So you want to capture intent. You want to prefetch the assets that are required. And you want to mask this transition with something. Right? And what are these something is, some, is what we'll talk about later. Loaders don't need to be boring either, right? Uh, so let's talk about loaders. You've got spinners, the basic, right? You've got progress bars. You've got skeletons, the new age loaders. Uh, I think all three of them are okay, uh, but no, it doesn't really hit home. So what do you want to do with loaders? I think you should just sit with the design team. They know best, right? Uh, but sure, let's, let's still talk about it. I think loaders need to be elaborate. They need to be, have a lot of moving components. Uh, they need to have a long travel, right? So, so that there is motion that can be actually perceived by the user. There's time that you can play around with. Uh, and a good example would be an app that everyone in India at least is very familiar with, right? And it's this, I don't even have to take the name of this app. And I think a lot of you people already know what this app is. Right? Uh, do we have any guesses? See? Right. It's, it's, so, uh, it's so cool that CRED was able to distinguish their visual identity in such a stark way. And they have a ton of motion. And they use this to mask all of these operations that happen behind. We're not talking about UX. Uh, we're not talking about like how great is the UX in general. But just this fact is insane, I think. And CRED has really nailed it down. So we had two, two ways to do it. Prioritizing visible content and optimizing the entire page. Right? I think there are three. We should also preemptively optimize for optimistic interactions that users might take. Uh, and one quick example would be like building a to-do list. So if you look at it here, we've got one form that is uh, taking an input and has a button. You have an action, uh, you have a submit button, submit action, which is setting to-dos. You have state and an input ref, and then you're rendering these to-dos. I think this is what it will look like. So, right? So there's a delay after you press create. What you can then do is, uh, thanks to React uh, and their new improvements, you can just use, use optimistic. Uh, and that will take care of most of the things that you want to uh, deal with. right? So use optimistic will help you here. Uh, you'd want to replace, you'd want to set your state and set optimistic as well. And you'd have to mock what your server response looks like. And that will, uh, and so that, you know, later on when React realizes that your call has been uh, resolved, it will replace it with the actual content. Uh, and you can add more things in it to figure out whether you're in the, uh, you know, pending state or you're done. And you've just changed, you've just, uh, you know, rendered the optimistic state instead. So this is what it looks like now. And I think this is so much better, right? Uh, see, it's so much faster. Uh, and if you want to take a look at how you can play with your uh, you know, pending state, I think you should just do like new. And then when you're optimistically rendering some, something, you're changing the styles. And then when you get an actual response, you're updating it. So this is a really neat way to do this. Uh, so your responsiveness has increased. This is something I don't think you should do. Right? This is, I would say, pessimistic UI. Uh, so check out what happens. Every time I search something, they render that it's empty and then they start rendering the content. So again, sit with your designs and think about what you're going to do. Uh, yes, 
is this this is also a question do you think we should do this all the time do you think we should do optimistic renting for add to carts you we should i don't think we should because think about it this way the moment you add something to cart your first instinct is go to cart right and if these operations haven't been completed going to cart would yield a blank page and i, I don't think that would be a good experience so there are places where you would want to uh, avoid it right and some of these places are where you know there are chained interactions happening you would want to leave all of those out uh, you would want to wait for the ui and maybe deal with it somewhere somewhat better what about navigation right so you can this is what our current pipeline would look like a very normal basic pipeline you fetch your container uh, you figure out where the user navigates fetch that container fetch its api fetch the widgets required and we do this step because we are uh, we are we are doing server driven ui so we at the front end we don't really know what we are supposed to paint right so the back end tells us what the layout needs to look like for that user you might not have this use case so your you know entire waterfall would be a lot shorter if you prefetch and you figured out intent like we discussed you would end up with you know uh, knowing what container needs to be fetched if you know what your container needs to be fetched and you still have more time i think you can fetch your apis as well maybe not the greatest of ideas uh, but you should play around it depending on how versatile your app is i can't do this at 1 mg because for drug let's say i'm showing a list of drugs right for every drug there would be a different api but they will all have the same container so i think in terms of benefits container fetching would self would give you enough but we still have to do some api calls because we do server driven ui and we don't know what to render after that uh, so once we fetch the apis we may fetch some of these widgets because now we know what are the first few widgets that are going to be rendered right this is what our time looks like today right so our containers usually take about 100 to 200 ms apis 100 to 300 and widgets less than 100 but i rounded off to 100 uh, so total it's about 450 milliseconds which is not bad right uh, but you still saw that even though this is not bad you can see all of those artifacts that people go through and you don't want that to happen uh, so what we can do here in math is that you can use loaders when uh you know the interaction is going to take longer than 200 ms but less than 10 seconds uh you can prefetch some of the things and we'll talk about prefetching in the talk tomorrow uh where we'll talk about how we are sort of adding more intelligence into our prefetching algorithm uh and we get more head starts we get like a bigger hit on our head start we don't want to suck up all the resources that the user has take up all the network as well Uh, so we are selectively figuring out what we need to prefetch and uh, vishal from my team would be talking about it you can also mask transitions and you know what's great for masking transition view transitions api it's a brilliant api right uh, it did not exist uh, long ago but today it is there and i think we should use it uh, at 1 mg 60% of our apps are web view and if you did not go through it uh, it did not realize it was webview i think we are doing a good job there right so this is what it looks like before optimization right let's do like a very small run right very basic but i would still say this is quick this is not slow by any nature right but see not fluent enough not great uh let's look at what we did after we have done all of these optimizations for us is this better <laughs> thank you ankit for the support was this a lot better than the previous one can we can we have like a quick cheer thank you yeah and these these are these are not complex optimizations to do i think everyone all of us if we sit down and focus on the chain we will be able to do it uh and why should you do it because you get you know more users uh, would be satisfied by your user you'll have lesser bounce rate better conversion your product will love you uh, and mostly because you're a good engineer man i think you should care about the people that you're building products for so these are the giants who worked on uh, these things and i i can't thank them more uh, for 
thinking and doing what they're doing. Uh, and that's my talk. Uh, if we can, if we want, if you want to have a Q and A, we still have time. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you've got. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. And can you talk a bit more about the container prefetching part that you explained? Yeah. So uh, ideally, I would say please wait for Vishal's talk because he covers it in in depth. Uh, but usually, the you'd want to finalize intent, right? So you could figure out intent with multiple things. One is how does the user's cursor move like, right? Usually when they are about to click on something, they have some patterns that you can sort of record and uh, play around with and see that, you know, this is how a click is about to happen. You can preemptively think that this is about to happen. And you can optimize for that and you can say that, you know, if X, they are about to go on this anchor tag in navigation. Uh, I know what this anchor tag, uh, you know, correlates to in terms of container. And you can fetch it from your stats.json and figure out that I need to fetch this asset. So you'd prefetch those assets earlier. Uh, later, what we are thinking is we'll also uh, maybe open source our router where we are doing most of these orchestration uh, so that everyone can use it. But, you know, we're a small team. We don't really know that we'd be able to uh, support open source in a way where we want to. But at least we'd be happy to help you guys build it yourself if you want. Uh, so that is how we do prefetching. We, yeah. So are you like, sort of timing the interaction or like for how much time the user is hovering on certain thing and then you are prefetching? Or, like, how are you maintaining that log that I need to take that decision preemptively? Yeah, so you could do this in two, three ways, right? One is, let's say, you use your intersection observer and you say, what is currently visible? Whenever there is idle, when the, whenever the thread is idle, let me start prefetching one by one. But you would also want to, then a smarter way to do it would be adding probability on top of it, some heuristics that tells you where the user is most likely to go. Uh, and on top of that, I think you, know, you can do multiple heuristics. One would be where is the cursor going? Are there elements that are being hovered uh, on? Uh, and you can't do that on mobile, right? And our primary focus has been mobile because 80% of India is online through mobile and they are not using expensive phones. So we want to optimize for them first. If we've done that, the rest of the job is easier. Uh, so so we, are, we are running a different set of operations and I think Vishal's talk will cover all of that. So tomorrow at 11.20, uh, that talk would commence. Yeah, yeah hi. Hi, Amir. Hey, so, um, I understand the point that you know you need to use re interactive loaders and transition to make it look smooth. But how do we make this easy for people who prefer reduced motion, in which like they don't want to see a lot of things moving and they don't want to see loaders that are like very interactive? Yeah. So have you thought about it? Do you handle it already? Or? So did you did you see the map that we did? Right. So for example, at one MGB, all of our operations post click will take about 450 ms. Right. Uh, I and you usually can get a about 500 millisecond head start if you already preemptively uh, figure out that you know the user is about to go here uh, and that should mask it so the transition additional transition is just for uh, added delight in 1mg's case but maybe your app would be a little bit different so you'd want to still play around with that threshold so for us it's not required today if i turn off those the view transition layer uh, i think we'll still render like correctly Hi, uh, nice talk. Uh, just wanted to understand, do you also take care of, or when you lazy load, how do you take care of your A-B test or whatever you're doing below the fold, uh -huh. correct? In that case, detecting which bundle to load from stat.json may be tougher or uh, do you take care of that currently at 1MG or it's yeah, a... Yeah, so uh, most of our A-B experiments are backend driven and we also have server driven UI. So the backend would usually let us know what needs to be rendered for this user. So it's simpler for that. The decision has already been made. But below the fold, when you take it, uh, take that call on the run time, correct? Uh. Yeah, we do. So once the thread is empty, the first priority is for us to start populating things that are below the fold. And later is when we want to do prefetching for the next navigation. And uh, because you talked about WebView, uh, uh, the Tata New app, uh, it's a WebView under WebView, like it opens Tata when MG below it, below the fold. Yeah, but like that, they are not using the bridge that we created for our apps. So there is a small uh, native to JS bridge, 
uh, and that is only in the 1MG app itself. Okay. okay. So which is why the experience at 1MG is a lot nicer. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank you.